It is my honor and privilege to introduce you to Orhan Pamuk, author of close to 20 books, winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature, and Turkey's best-selling writer. Being in conversation with him tonight is also the only reason that my parents, two Turkish doctors, have forgiven me for becoming a professor of literature. So he can, he can add that to his list of accomplishments. Thank you, Orhan. Uh, we are here to talk about his most recent novel, Nights of Plague, which the reviewer for The Guardian described as the single most interesting book she had read this year, and which my colleague at The New Yorker, James Wood, praised as creating a world so detailed, so magically full, so introverted and personal in emphasis that it shimmers like a memory palace. Fans of his will recognize in Nights of Plague the telltale Pamukian techniques, a frame narrative written by a historian, a murder that opens onto a detective story, factional politics, mix, the mixed results of westernized, westernization and modernization, a fascination with enchanted and beautiful objects, and a fascination with the combination of science and the arts. And on that note, I will invite Orhan to the stage to read you a little excerpt from Knights of Plague. So nice to be here. You hear my voice, right? And it's all okay? Um, I'll give you a spoonful from the ocean. It's 700 pages, no, less than that. So I'll read you half a page from, this is from page 200 of Knights of Plague. Dr. Nuri is one of, perhaps, one of the most important characters. Dr. Nuri woke up before dawn. As he got dressed, he watched his sweetly sleeping wife, and at the same time, kept thinking that the rumors must be true, that the governor, Pasha, must be planning to do what governors usually did in emergencies and execute Ramis and his two henchmen without waiting for approval from the high court in Istanbul. He walked down the stairs followed by the respectful glances of the guards on night shift and made instinctively for the inner courtyard. <clears throat> Most executions were carried out in the inner courtyards of government buildings, but there was nobody there. The overgrown sheep dog that was always tethered to the railings on the kitchen windows and barked relentlessly every night had vanished at the start of the plague outbreak. In the darkness, there was not even a single shadow to be seen. He walked past the columns of the domed gallery and felt, felt like a ghost. As he slowly circled the square, he kept thinking that any moment now he would run into someone, but the night was like a dark, two-dimensional room. No matter how many steps he took, he could not find his way out of that black box, but sometimes the shadow of a tree or a faded color would drift silently past him. He passed the quarantine notices and the shuttered shops, then turned into an alleyway and walked in the dark for a long time across the never-ending streets of the plague-ridden city. I'm leaving this book here and now sitting down. <laughs> So, we have a novel set in 1901 about a plague mm -hmm. and about the quarantine mm -hmm. that ensues. Mm -hmm. But you started working on this novel well before the yes. events of March 2020, as mm -hmm. I understand it. Yes, I began first to think about this novel almost 40, 45 years ago. In fact, in my early novels in The White Castle, there is a plague scene. Uh, in my Silent House, which is my second published novel, there is an Ottoman historian who was re researching for documents about a plague in Ottoman times. P 
plague and Islam. Uh, it was a special subject I was interested in. And at the beginning, I was thinking to set my novel in medieval Islam, medieval times, many, for many reasons. That again, in Silent House, there is an idea of that what makes distinction between Western ways of thinking, these are essentialist no vulgarizations or the traditional Muslim Islamic way of or a non-Western way of seeing things is individuality. So death, death or anxiety of death triggers individuality and plague gives you so many dead bodies mm -hmm. that it's a good, um, good, good trigger or good bullet to move the events, concentrate the events. Then another 20 years passed. I didn't write that novel. Perhaps I was now, perhaps under the influence of Edward Said, was thinking about all these Westerners. I was reading a lot of travel books when I was writing White Castle, were saying that there was also a plague in White Castle. These Muslims, they, um, they are not taking the plague seriously. They are fatalistic. They say it's overwritten in our hair, al numzaya zulmush. So if God had decided we'll be dead, what can we do? So I didn't write that novel too. Another 10 or 15 years passed. Then I begin to get aware about the third so-called, because some disagree, third plague pandemic, which started 1894. And then also the dominant um, pandemic in 19th century was cholera. There was cholera, the cholera quarantine uprisings in Poland, in Russia. And my subject began to get uh, political. And I also saw that the imposition of quarantine is most of the time is possible because inevitably uh, governments get authoritarian. Now Turkish government, uh, Erdogan's government was getting authoritarian. And I said, well, this was five years ago. And I had a whole huge whole shelf of plague books, plague Islam, or Ottoman um, governor's memories. So I, should, I said, I'll write this book, which will be a sort of an allegory about a government getting authoritarian. In the end, like all novels, you know, I always say, don't forget that James Joyce started Ulysses as a short story. Uh, 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 in, uh, in the end, my novel turned out to be a sort of a, a fresco, panoramic picture mm. of the declining of the days of Ottoman Empire, its disintegration, and its incapacity to control its various countries. Um, um, so when the plague overtook, I was already three and a half years in writing the book. And of course, the Ottoman Empire was referred to as the sick man. Yes, that was that. The sick empire. Uh, yeah, by the uh, other yes, empires. that was Russian char said that, and everyone attributes to Europe. Europe, but it was very popular. Mm -hmm. It's even what you read in Turkish high school textbooks. Yeah. So, so how did the events of March 2020 influence the way you were thinking about representing? people breaking quarantine, not wanting to obey the rules, the way that the imposition of quarantine... Well, things were really different. But in yeah. the end, all governments, and Turkish government is not different, um, managed it in their own way. In fact, there were so many ironies. First of all, if you're asking about the government behavior, in here in New York, I was coincidentally here, uh, although I come here in fall, uh, uh, fall semesters, I was here for something. Then. Trump was saying, ah, oh, it will pass in April, uh, and, and was not doing much, while I, in, in this panicky day towards the end of March, as everyone rushed to airports and went back to the whole world was getting towards lockdown, mm -hmm. um, I came to Istanbul, and Erdogan already closed, like a ultra-secular, radical secularist, closed all the Turkish mosques while all the churches in Western civilization were open. Turkish mosque, and now I'm living next to a mosque, there was a little 
paper on it because of coronavirus, the, all the mosques in our country. Then Erdogan probably thought, this is, I'm going too much, I'm losing votes because business is closed. More or less, all the governments behave the same way. That is, if you begin to lose votes, find that if you lock down too much, then they open up. Mm -hmm. And if you open up too much, so many dead people, they lock down. That's what all the governments right. did. Maybe another uh, interesting thing was uh, that I immediately, I was, first, my friends were call, telling Norhan, this, you're writing this esoteric novel, who knows about quarantine? Who would read your novel? <laughs> so the, suddenly my friends, the same people begin to call me saying, wow, you're lucky I was not. My aunt died one of the first victims in Istanbul. It's still, not only that she, I loved her, liked her, but she, she did not, she is not buried in the grave that she was thinking about. Mm. She wanted, because some people with white dresses came up, came and picked her body. But I was, in those days, now if you're asking that, very much afraid, in fact, realized that I did so much research, but my characters, you don't learn from this from research, we're not afraid of, of me. While one in 100 dies in coronavirus, at the beginning it, has, it was a bit mysterious, there was no vaccination, uh, but plague kills one in three, and there is no way out of it. So I injected, and the definite change was, I learned that when there is a pandemic like that, you are so very much afraid, so I injected my fear to my characters. There's actually a moment in the novel when a journalist who has been jailed by oh, yes. the government is reading a copy of Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. Yes. And Leviathan was written in the shadow of many, many, many plagues and in fact makes an argument that pestilence is the reason for the emergence of the territorial state. And I think we actually have an image Now that you said this, now you, you see how, how well pre uh, prepared we are. Ping the first image. <laughs> okay. This is Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, and it is for, uh, we decided that it will be the, uh, 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 a sort of an illustration of how uh, there is a relationship between uh, imposition of quarantine and politics. And as I said, I decided to write this novel, not because there, that I knew that this will happen, but because Turkish government was getting increasingly authoritarian. This is, an, there is, there is, this is an academic subject that, in fact, a Swiss, Swiss scholar looked at this, and we all know what this book is about, the horrible, strong, uh, animal-like state controlling. But people, as you see from the states, it should be a cute person, buddy. There, <laughs> there, there are people, they want, they want security. They unfortunately want this monstrous person to control and govern so that they will feel secure. Second picture, oops, this is the town you saw on the frontispiece that it looks a bit empty, don't you think so? Uh, maybe there is a lockdown. Maybe we see the third picture, but the digital, okay, now the digitals, digit, digits are making it, these, these are two uh, little per, uh, persons on the right hand side of the uh, cover of the frontispiece picture. In, inside that picture we see these two figures. They are wearing um, play clothes. They have beam, beaks, right? Yeah. Uh, in which they put, they used to put vinegar or this or that, that will keep away from the plague bacteria or whatever they thought at the time. So, photos are over, thank you. Um, um, uh, so, this was for us, for me, and I made one of the characters read Leviathan so that I can also suggest, say, scholarly things you don't understand. There are so many allusions in my novel, such as this one. Um, for the fun of it, I showed you one saying, one of the characters are, uh, that Thomas Hobbes was implying that the state's, the government's job is not only protect you from the enemies by its, by, by its military, 
but, but also protect you uh, from the plague. But again, when it, the government, the state, protects you from the plague, it gets a very horrible Leviathan. Mm. That's, this gets to be a, this cruel animal. And it's not an accident that it's a journalist who has been thrown in jail for writing yes, the true of course, story of the plague, the, who happens uh, yes, to be reading yeah, the Leviathan. Yes, well, yes. I don't want to exaggerate these things. There are these kind of <laughs> allusions. I, there, there are also private jokes, allusions in my books. But if you miss them, you don't miss the book. It's only 3%, 4%. <laughs> that, uh, I make these jokes, some of them very private. Only my wife, my friends understand. Some of them are more social like this, but in the end, the value of the book is does not, you don't miss the, va the book if you don't see them. So, so for people who haven't read the book yet, oh, I think two things maybe to orient them to. The, the first is that the book is narrated by a historian named Mina, a woman who has been tasked with the responsibility of editing the letters of Princess Pakizet who mm -hmm. is the Ottoman princess who has lived on the island of Mingaria and ruled the island of Mingaria during the plague. And that we have her narration and her narration of Princess Pakize's letters. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was very, very interesting the way that you foreground the voices of these two very smart, very level-headed women in a world where the men are sort of foolish and bumbling and the things that they bring about, they bring about almost inadvertently, mm -hmm. almost accidentally. There's mm -hmm. a kind of accidental politics. I agree. So mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about First of all, uh, I've been asked this question many times, and I, I'm straight about it. I'll just tell you directly that when I published my first novels in Turkey, um, um, my women readers and also not, uh, readers of novels, serious literature, novel readers are probably 65-7%, my very humble experience, are women, were telling me in Turkey, Mr. Pamuk, we like your novels very much, but we don't see too much women in your novels. And I'm, uh, 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 we'd love to see more, okay? Before many, many years before Me Too or anything like this. So it says, I think I finally achieved to see my story Henry James says that he has a story, but who will see the story? So you begin to see it, my stories through a woman's eyes. First, in my name is read Shekure, which is my mother has also the same name. Oh, is my also, grandmother's name. Uh, you really? Okay. Halitzia, one of the early Turkish novels also, you love that name. Um, uh, um, so uh, uh, I decided uh, um, um, yeah, to tell my stories, to see my stories more through women's eyes, and uh, and I uh, and it's a self-imposed. I reformed myself, self-imposed idea of involving, and also I am experienced novelist. What is that novel? Is that uh, it, art of the novel is based on a very single, unique hu uh, human char characteristics. We have, I don't, we don't know other animals, but we have the power to feel compassion to others. We have imagination. If someone is suffering, we, in our minds, manage to see that person's pains and will be sorry for this person. Mm -hmm. And it's a, an art of the novel is based on, our, on this capacity to see uh, others pains, not only pains, happiness, jealousy, confused, conflicting, confused feelings. And not only that, writers do like to imagine themselves as other persons. Mm. So, of course I can, after writing novels for 45 years, of course I can identify with a woman. And you can transcend cla uh, gender, class, geography, I don't know history a bit. I do that in history. Um, and it's, and your readers read your books because you are, you are jumping into others' consciousness. They, the readers also, when you, they read a, even a contemporary novel from you, they also want to see how other people are jealous, angry, frustrated, happy, uh, this or that. 
Um, so yes, I should tell my story, see more women. I should not only write autobiographical novels, that's what I thought, and I will continue to uh, do so. <laughs> so Mina, when she starts narrating, says this is both a historical novel and a history written as a novel. And there are these wonderful moments throughout when she says, I have to stop being a historian now. I will be a sentimental novelist for a moment. And I would just add to that that on top of giving us this fictional world, you also create fictional historical documents that you yes. litter throughout yes. the world. So as I was reading it, I kept thinking, what is the difference for you between history and the art of the novel. What does one make possible first that of the all, other doesn't? First of all, um, when I came to the United States um, at that time, it is uh, my first wife's husband and was a visiting scholar at Columbia. They were very kind to me. I immediately got um, radical postmodernists uh, and um, and postmodern postmodernism was the fashion. Then I'm still uh, a mellowed down postmodernist uh, in way. Uh, uh, but they had taught me that both history and literature are fiction. <laughs> they were very, uh, very straight and honest about it. Mm -hmm. This is one thing, and, uh, but it was not only postmodernism. Tolstoy wrote War and Peace and 2,000 pa pages, and then there is at the end an epilogue, 50 pages of his arguing the place of individual in history, history's meaning. Marxists love that subject. The, what is the, the importance of the individual in history. So this is also a Tolstoyan novel. You know, I sometimes jokingly say all my life, I tried to combine Tolstoy, two great writers, Tolstoy and Borges in Istanbul. My novels are an attempt to come write like a Borges and Tolstoy simultaneously and set my stories in Istanbul. That's me, in a way. So in a Tolstoyan fashion, tongue in cheek, the book is arguing. Then the, another reason is that the book covers 100 years, so you need, a, uh, you need a narrator who is outside of the frame because no one lives 100 years, so I needed a historian who will sum up the event and quickly, joyfully, and with playfully give the summary. This happened, that happened. Uh, these are the reasons why I have two female uh, narrators. Well, I want to push on what you said about, okay. history, about history being a kind of fiction, because to me, the funniest parts of this novel are the moments where an event takes place that in retrospect will oh, be viewed as decisive. Yes. I, for instance, the scene in which the flag of yes. Nigeria is born. But when you, when you experience the fictional narration of that, it turns out that it was kind of a mistake that it wasn't planned, that the rise of Mingarian nationalism itself is just a kind of a, a, a comedy of errors okay. almost. So, so yeah, talk okay. about that. Talk then, about that. okay, now the writer, I am the writer, he, maybe the book is not doing that, but that was my intention. In this novel, I uh, not only wanted to tell, narrate, explore the subject of empire, uh, is the uh, Ottoman Empire, or, or empires are disintegrating, mm. are finishing, declining, and when the empire finishes off, disintegrates, the emperor, or the kaiser, or the sultan, or the king, or the shah, who has the uh, uh, godly, or uh, religious qualities, when he disappears, there is a void of meaning in our lives because we used to go to war for our king, not for the flag, not for the blood, not for the nation, not for Turkishness, not for um, um, this or that. That it was the king, the kaiser, the emperor that gave, uh, securing him gave our me meaning to our lives. But once it uh, disappears, then there is a secular, small, secular nationalistic states, and you have to invent secular nationalist myths. 
And this book, 700 pages, is also about invention of secular myths that myth motivate us. Now we are saying, I'll die for my flag. I'll die for Turkishness. I'll die for this. I'll die for Kemal Atatürk. And, and I'm saying that these secular myths are also made up of what you refer to as tiny trivial matters mm -hmm. that in 50 years, 60 years, they are elevated into what we read in the high school textbooks, their positions, the random events which are very casual and which are, I made up my business to make them look very humane, now are glorified and in, on the banknotes or in the statues all over the secular new world. So yes, Knights of Plague is also about invention of secular myths that give uh, secular nationalistic myths that give meaning to our lives. Well, and so many of those myths come to rest on ordinary objects. I mean, mm. you are fascinated yes. with the way that ordinary objects become enchanted or suffused with history. And there's a very sort of nostalgic way in which that Yes, can there are so many um, 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 in, um, ideas that uh, I am an admirer of French writer Georges Perec. But not only that, I am a museum person. I am that I am interested in the power of the objects to generate that uh, bring us back the lost time. Of course, Proust and his Madeleine. But my take is different, a bit slightly different, not very different, but a bit different. My example would be: we go to a movie, then we put the ticket into our pocket, then we forget it for 20 years, then we put it in the but oh. The ticket brings us the movie back. Uh, in that sense, I'm Proustian. Instead of the Madeleine, I have a movie ticket that I always keep these things. But uh, compared to Proust in literature, that, that I am a postmodernistic Proust. Why? Because my characters and me uh, prepare the Madeleines, uh, enjoy the Madeleines. Proust involuntary remembers. He just eats his madland. Ah, then remembers. It's not <laughs> intended. While my characters first prepare the madland, oh, okay, Kemal does this in Museum of Innocence, then enjoys his madland and remembers. And a museum, in fact, is a collection of various intended madlands. And for those of you who will read the novel, when you read the novel, you should look out for the cameo by novelist and history enthusiast Orhan Pamuk oh, yes. in it, which uh, comes the... right around a, a scene, a visit to a museum, yes. in fact, which is what made me think of that. I want to go back to something that you said earlier about individuality. Uh, you know, like several of your other novels, there is a murder, or actually two murders, two assassinations that take place in Knights of Plague. And as the novel progresses, and as the death toll rises, we sort of forget about these murders. Yes, I, yes, I'm sorry. I was very proud to see my, my black book and my name is read are also the same. Yes. That yes. we start as a detective story, but in the end, we don't much care, uh, much care who is the murderer. Right. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> uh, but my murder stories are like that, then yes, yes. you start to solve a problem. But I was so happy that in, uh, um, in village, I mean, in, um, uh, in uh, Soho, there was a detective bookshop. When I saw, uh, uh, almost 25 years ago, a copy of Black Book was there. When they were selling my Black Book, I was so proud. And maybe, uh, <laughs> between Agatha Christie's and everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I mean, I, I want to hear you say a little bit more about, you know, the idea that when there is mass death, how do we think about individuality? I mean, how do we. Okay, do we that is interesting. Okay, all plague narratives, and there are very few, or narratives uh, of Ottoman Islamic world. Mm -hmm. There are scholars on this, right? They read old texts, or, and most of them are written in Mesnevis, that is in uh, po uh, poems, that uh, 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 trying to grasp the feelings of uh, uh, the uh, people. Um, come again, your story, a quick question again. Uh, well, my, my question
question was, you know, we have, I'll phrase it a little bit differently, right? So for the past three years, we have lived with a rising death toll. Millions upon millions mm -hmm. upon millions. And, and what's the relationship with individual? What's the, yeah, what, what happens to individuality? Okay, then, in okay, like the most, one of the most important cliche-like uh, quotations is when there is, uh, when there is that kind of fear, the mother is not like a mother. Your father is not like your father. Family is not like a fa family. Suddenly, the mother gets to be, the, our, you know, we have an idea of a mother on a pedestal, right? She is self-sacrificing. Suddenly, you see that the mother is very egoistic and she wants to save herself. You see the father is not the father. There is no family. That is, I think, one of the most horrific idea anyone, especially children, can even, cannot even entertain in their mind's eye because your mother is not there to protect you. She is there to protect herself. That is what plague makes to people. Um, I, um, so I, once you have that, then I thought, wow, it's, a, it's a, I, of course, not a nice situation, but a nice situation for a writer that you can do wonders. You can, I can do fictional uh, acrobatics there. That is, that see the fear through children's eye, see the fear from people's eye. Um, this is when I say I wanted to set a novel in medieval Islam and see what happens. And, uh, put a lot of, uh, partly maybe I sometimes think I didn't do it much because perhaps now I am thinking, really thinking aloud, entertaining this thought for the first time, perhaps because what's happening in the world also uh, took away my original story of that kind of drama that in the end coronavirus is not plague. It is, we know we can survive. It was more relaxed. I think my interesting question that I asked myself was that although it is compared to it, one is it kills one in three, and you cannot get once you have it, you're dead. While it kills one in hundred, but yet still we were, relatively speaking, I think my judgment we were too much afraid. Why I ask myself? It perhaps because we were looking at TV and we were seeing too much dead people being burned in India, trucks full of, uh, full of dead bodies in Italy. There was no way out. That was how we feared. But I think fear, uh, anxiety of death, and this is also in my silent house, makes you egoistic. Egoism is not too far, about, too far away from individuality, you know. Okay, that's interesting, right? Mm -hmm. so, so mass death, yeah, has the effect of both obliterating the individual while also making the individual Yes, more I see what you mean, obliterating yeah. things, but yeah. yes, yeah. But okay, then I think it was in, um, 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 I think it was in Lolita that Nobakov sometimes admired Lolita because, you know, she said to, uh, whom, uh, what, uh, whom, whom, yeah, uh, to, to narrator, you know, what's horrible about that is that you are on your own, Lolita said. Yeah. So we are, now we refer to Lolita yeah. about death and individuality. Yeah. She was earlier than us. She said, what is scary or uh, about death that you are on your own? And you, you see that in this novel. There are so many moments of people you know, what you describe of, of mothers leaving children, of children wandering around looking for their parents, of people dying on their own in dark places, in dank places, away from everybody. And then there's another kind of isolation that we also see, which are the people that are under house arrest by the government. Uh, Princess Pakize sitting, writing her letters, uh, under surveillance, essentially. Mina, a hundred years later, when she's writing, uh, knowing that her things will be searched, her belongings will be searched, and even saying at some point, the manuscript that you are reading now has probably been read by the Mingarian government and, and, and vetted. So that's another kind of isolation. Uh, okay, that for, uh, for, this is the isolation of Ottoman aristocracy, mm. that 
not only because of paranoia of the, one of the last rulers of Ottoman Empire, Abdul Hamid II, who ruled over, I think, 34 years, was a sort of a Queen Victoria of Turkey because she, well, he also did a lot of the modernization, hospitals, railroads, telegraph, this or that, uh, modernization of the army, but she was also a despot, a repressive person, closed the early Turkish parliament, so forth and so on. So much was happening uh, during his time. He was also not a typical, he, uh, I referred to him in, uh, as the founder, or he on his own discovered political Islam because Ottoman Empire was disintegrating and he wanted to say to the British especially and the French that if you take away my empire or if you take away the island of Mingaria, yeah. then I will, since I am the caliph, the sort of a pope of all of the Muslims, I will make all the all Islamic world, the Muslims of India, in Pakistan, Indonesia will uprise against you, but I forget your question, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> was he the one was he the one who liked the Sherlock Holmes novels? Sorry? He was the one yes. who liked the Sherlock Abdul Holmes Hamid novels. He was also, obsessed with Dorothy yes. uh, yes. Enjoyed uh, 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 reading Canon Doyle, and this was also factual. There are there are PhDs written about Abdul Hamid and Canon Doyle because this, uh, that up, uh, Abdul Hamid's last years were also the years of the invention of uh, directive stories by French and English, and he had a group of translators. They were not only translating uh, all the Western newspapers that is important for him, but they were also translating, very busy translating directive novels because, because his highness would every night, if someone read before a Japanese paravan or uh, screen uh, a detective novel and he would listen and fall asleep. Um, and he had a, a taste for Kanon Doyle. He admired him so much, he invited him to Istanbul. He, uh, I'm sure, uh, just like all the doctors, he was important from France. He probably proposed a lot of money. He came to Istanbul. He gave him a medal. He, Conan Doyle was married to, just married to his second wife, wanted to visit Yildiz Palace, and Abdul Hamid immediately got paranoid because they warned, Your Honor, maybe his next novel will be set in your palace, and he didn't <laughs> like that. And so he didn't see him. These were, uh, if these are details that everyone, I mean, everyone who reads books, intellectual, knows in Turkey, Abdul Hamid and his obsession with detective stories. He was also, uh, had many, but in fact, the philosophy of the book, detective murder story, in My Name is Red, it was about unique style, which can, you cannot have a style with your intentions. It's a mistake. At that time, 16th century, an ideal Ottoman painter would be a sort of a color photo, photo, photocopy machine. But if you make a mistake, which is the mistake of the murderer, then the logic of that book, murderer's mistake and artist style. Here, Abdul Hamid wants, admires, so why does he admire Sherlock Holmes? He is getting the truth in courts by beating, beating, torture, torture, while he is reading someone who solves only the problems intellectually, right? Uh, so isn't this a contradiction? I think, yeah, that's a joy to see that someone who is getting the legal truth by beating and systematic torture and imprisoning people admires Sherlock Holmes, who never does that, but sits in a place just like Abdul Hamid. There is also an affinity. They, Abdul Hamid and Sherlock Holmes were sitting. Uh, Watson or his Abdul Hamid's bureaucracy was bringing all the facts, and Abdul Hamid was reading them, making continuously making, he was a hardworking man, continuously making decisions. So, in both My Name is Red and in this novel, and also in Black Book, yes, I agree, My, you don't finish the book, who's the murderer, you are lost, but you, begin, you may begin with that, but there is also a hidden philosophy 
which perhaps is too, too much hidden that I have to tell it like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, no, no, I think, I think that one, you know, one thing that's very clear in the novel and what you just said about Abdul Hamid and Sherlock Holmes makes it even clearer is that what looks like freedom may actually be the precursor to a kind of unfreedom. Oh, and there's an amazing moment in the sort of epilogue mm -hmm. where you write, uh, we should note that the custom of gunning journalists oh, and yes. writers down in the street with the total backing of the state was first born under the new regime. Yes, that is also, uh, okay, because look, it's the same today too. They don't shoot journalists in Russia, do they? Because they can finish them off like this by the help of the state. You can only, you need to kill a journalist because you cannot silence him in a, in a democracy. Mm. You cannot, you have to, uh, the journalist is talking and talking. Your legal system is not enough to silence him. Mm -hmm. That's perhaps the definition of a good democracy. Mm -hmm. that you, the government hates the journalist, but he can operate because the government doesn't have the means. Mm -hmm. But if the government does have the means, you know, mm. you know, you're right, this is a terrorist story, you say something, bing, he goes to jail, mm -hmm. then you don't have to kill him. Mm. Uh, I think that journalists are killed in, mostly in open societies because the society, or I don't, I don't know, I don't remember any journalists being killed in a, they just send them to jail, that's not, you know, no, the, the government says, I am, finishing him off. I don't need a mysterious killer. I don't killer. help, yeah. I don't. Well, actually, this goes back to the question that we both forgot that I, ha that I had asked. I'm which sorry. Was, no, no, that's okay. I'd forgotten too. But, you know, that scene of Princess Pakize scribbling under house arrest reminds me of a piece that you recently wrote uh, after the attack on Salman Rushdie about how the writer needs to be protected. Oh, I see, yes. Um, and how that scene of, the, there are so many scenes in this novel of writers being protected whether they want it or not. Oh, I see, yes. Okay, so I'm angry. Of course, I may be wrong, I apologize. But um, I am also, had a, not of, of course as grave as Salman's, but I also have sometimes bodyguards, and now I have a bodyguard. I used to have more one, one bodyguard in Turkey, but it's not, an, it's not a good feeling, although my bodyguard is a nice person, he's my friend. Uh, um, it's, it's not a nice feeling. And, and you tend to say, well, okay, I'm free. I actually, I don't need, and this is a subject that I discuss with my wife, maybe I don't want bodyguards anymore. Uh, but, but whenever they ask us, we say, no, no, we don't need, we are normal. We, our lives return to normal, uh, right? Because it's a dream, but actually it's not true. If anyone invites you, this organization has the responsibility to protect you, no matter what you say. I don't need anyone. No, they have to protect you. So that's what I am critical about. So writers should be protected, yes. And also, so, uh, uh, Parkize is writing, um, the book is sandwiched between two female narrators. The main narrator is getting all the information from her husband, who is Dr. Nuri, that I've read about one single uh, two uh, paragraphs. And she's a doctor that goes to distant, distant neighborhoods and fights bravely, plague in 1901, and tells all the stories to her, to his wife. And she writes these stories to her elder sister, which is a real person. You know, it's, my novel has real Tolstoyan qualities. In a Tolstoyan historical novel, you see Napoleon and Tolstoy really did his research. It, it, then you see Pierre, who is an imaginary person. So Hatice is real, a real person. She is a beauty. If you Google her, you will even see her uh, <laughs> photo. While uh, my, uh, my Pakise is an imaginary character. I, she lives with her father, her sisters, her father, her father's harem, a huge group of people ex-Ottoman uh, ex sultan, um, dethroned, and now his L younger um, brother is in throne, and they spent 25 years living in a huge mansion, which happened to be half a, or 
a, a quarter of a mile away from my house and I used to look at them because at that time I didn't know that they lived there, by the way. You live in Istanbul, you see 70 years, you pass so many buildings, then in your 50th year, oh, he lived there, oh, I also lived there. But you don't realize <laughs> yeah, yeah. that, for example, I just um, learned that in the house that I was born, Leon Trotsky stayed for, lived for three months, some 18 years before I was born, because he was living in Prinkipo in a wooden house. The house burned down. A Turkish government took him uh, in, in 1933 to another place in Istanbul. So that was where, 19 years later, I was born. But that I learned only two years ago. No one said <laughs> this to me. There is um. That's, that's an amazing story. There's, you know, I, we're sort of coming to the end of our time. I'm just a little bit mindful of that. Um, you know, the, the, the ending of the novel, and I don't think I'm giving anything away by saying this, uh, since we know it doesn't matter who committed the murder anyway. I, the, in the ending of the novel, Mina, as our narrator, is a kind of divided figure. On the one hand, oh, yes. she's, she's accused of not being sufficiently Mingarian, when she's called upon to speak the language, she can read it, but she can't speak it. Uh, but then her colleagues back home accuse her of being the best nationalist that one could imagine. And I'm curious about that term nationalism for you, because it is a kind of dirty word today. Okay, But yes. in your novel, there seems to be a moment before the emergence of the Hobbesian state, a moment before the nation is a force of coercion. No, also, not only that, nationalism was also a, um, a force for a desire for freedom. Yeah. That I think, and I, th I make this clear, I think, in one of these paragraphs mm -hmm. uh, where Mina is talking, but I forgot who was talking, maybe, um, uh, that for, uh, for this novel, there are two kinds of nationalism. The nationalism, when as the empires disintegrate and fall apart, the nationalism of the Bulgarian, Serbian, Greek, mm. Kurdish, Armenian, Arabic, Egyptian nationalism, or of course, Turkish nationalism as well, is a respectable thing because then you know, out of the, uh, the empire is falling apart and the nation wants to have, the nation is being invented, you know? Yeah. Uh, of course, whether nations are invented, imaginary uh, communities, or are actually real, there's no imagination there, they are real, you know? Mm -hmm. It's another subject. Uh, so, the, in that stage, when empire still continues, wants to be an empire, and nations uprise against the authoritarian Abdul Hamid or Kaiser, then nationalism is progressive or is a positive thing. But now, nationalism, um, in my part of the world, uh, nationalists are the persons who say, yes, whatever the government does, it's okay. The, our, my government does always, whatever they do, always, uh, all, I am always on the government side. This is, what, this is the refrain we hear from the uh, nationalists. There is nothing more than that. Uh -huh. And it is a way of saying, I am on the government side. Nationalism in, in this age, ex, uh, in say 2022, uh, for me, is not a very respectable thing, unless there is a small minor nation who is fighting against a dominant other nation. This, then that is mostly, that is maybe understandable. But the way the word is used, um, it's, uh, it's not a positive word now. Maybe I'll end by just asking you if you have any hope that we might be able to find something that is that progressive freedom granting version of the nation, or is that, can that only exist no, in uh, novels? I think, um, um, we, we, I think I believe in cosmopolitanism than nationalism, uh, uh, that I think uh, the greatest things that Turkey or any nation achieved is mostly if uh, you got from other nations, other geographies, or being openness, welcoming immigrants, 
uh, uh, being transparent, open society, these are things that always contradict repressive ideas of nationalism. I think, um, I believe, I believe in uh, westernization, Kemal Atatürk, whoever, the last Ottoman rulers were also uh, occidentalists. I am openly an occidentalist, believe in that the Turkey should continue to be westernized. I believe in western values. I hope that those values we realize feminism, individual respect for individuals' rights, free speech, democracy, these are the things that I believe. Um, nationally, most of the time, the word of nation, uh, glorification of the nation and nationalism comes when these ideas are curtailed. The, I see the future of Turkey being part of Europe, European Union, open society, democracy, and nationalism is not a great word for me, unfortunately. <laughs> well, let's end on that more hopeful yeah. note. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you for coming.